Okay. <clears throat> Hello everyone and welcome to uh, today's episode. Today's episode is a interesting title. Um, it's going to be divided into two parts. I'm going to speak. I'm going to explain to the audience uh, the concept of archaeo futurism, and then I'm going to speak about the potentials of the pro uh, cultural program and how it can, uh, uh, um, uh, what kind of implication the archaeo futuristic outcome of the of of the evolution of culture may have. So let's begin. Archaeofuturism. Archaeofuturism uh, is a term coined by a man named Gulam Fay, uh, born from 7 November 1949 to 6 March 2019. He was a French journalist, writer, and advocate of identi identi identitarianism as part of the French New Right. Um, anyways, the guy, okay, I'm going to read this first. Uh, Archaeofuturism, a concept coined by Fay in 1998, refers to the re reconciliation of techno science with archaic values. <clears throat> that means, believe it or not, in 1998, this philosopher Fay, that coined the term Archaeofuturism, it's very similar to Terence McKenna's Archaic Revival. Now, I don't know who got there first, but it, it's, it's an idea that I could see, like, just like how a certain plant grows in different parts of the world. Similarly, I could see an idea like this arising in different minds. But anyways, from, Faye, <coughs> from Faye's perspective, uh, it's the reconciliation of techno-science with archaic values. Uh, Fay argues that the term archaic should be understood in its original ancient Greek meaning as the foundation or the beginning, not as an attachment to the past. According to Fay, anti-moderns and counter-revolutionaries are actually mere constructs of modernity, sharing the same biased linear conception of time. <clears throat> Defining his theories as non-modern, Fay was influenced by Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of eternal return and Michael Maffasoli's postmodern sociological works. <clears throat> now, I don't really know who this man was, but the concept of archaeofuturism is crucial because the human being functions in a space-time continuum. And so in different moments of time, the space on this earth has been functioned, has been handled differently, has been uh, maneuvered differently. <clears throat> Terence McKenna, when he spoke about the concept of the archaic revival, he was saying that history repeats itself, but it repeats itself in a unique relationship where sometimes the modern can think they are doing something new only to discover it's archaic many questions that I personally had without even looking at what other philosophers had said had taken me to certain points of consideration where it was as if I noticed other people in the past have questioned it. You know, people of the modern age should be very considerate. There's a technological uh, veil, mask on our face. Do you know? And when this technological mask goes away, which is occupying the attention, then the person's questions on nature arise. Deep questions on nature arise when your attention is not occupied. <clears throat> you know, I, I always thought about it that so many people in this world, they think about an instruction booklet. They think about uh, finding some sort of advice to living. And then, there was a moment where I was like, maybe it doesn't have instructions, this cosmos. Maybe man needs to instruct himself so he doesn't feel like emptiness is everywhere. You know, you know it's, a, it's a very big debate that is the human being keeping itself busy as a sort of act of resistance, resistance to something as Deleuze, this French philosopher, would say, the act of creation is an act of resistance. So the fact that I'm creating right now, 
you know, from Deleuze's perspective, it's a resistance of something. I'm resisting something to be able to create something different in the past. This picture I've chosen is archaeofuturistic to some degree. We can see that people have technologies, yet their style is archaic, you know. I think the thing is, the future is always trying the new. And sometimes when there's failure in your attempt at the new, you have nothing else to fall back on the previous foundation. In this case, um, Faye suggesting it as... The archaic. It's fascinating. Just like how I look at my own wardrobe and I see different clothing there, I look at history and I look at different ways that human beings' minds were dressed for the occasion. And, you know, people are not just dressed for gatherings or parties or whatever, you know. People are also dressed for the event in history that they are part of, you know. It's fascinating to me how everybody has to find their true nature. The whole self-help industry is, is in some sense, I don't know, I, of course, I'm just one man perceiving it, but the way I perceive the self-help industry is that it's actually not self-help. Yourself is not helping you. Even though you go and buy the book and you sit down and you read it, but the idea is if you want yourself, yourself, to help you, then you cannot keep following the self of others. This is something I understood. You're in the shadows of others until you understand the meaning of the light. And then you understand the value of the light. And understanding the value of the light is similar to understanding the value of a microphone. You know, there's some people who are afraid of the stage. They're afraid. Me personally, when I was younger, um, in high school, I would do these PowerPoint presentations. Like I was in grade 10 you know, for this um, English, um, uh, what was it called? It was like a writing course, <coughs> grade 10 writing course, the whole class. And uh, anyways, in the thing, <coughs> in, the, uh, in the PowerPoint presentations, I remember the first thing I had to present was Dante's Inferno, the levels of hell and the levels of heaven. You know, my first... <laughs> PowerPoint presentation, I'm like, all right, let's see, what can I say about the levels of hell and the levels of heaven as Dante, in Dante's Inferno, had suggested. I remember uh, going up to give that presentation and noticing that it was as if I wasn't comfortable in the view of myself. And when you're not comfortable to yourself, oh, the environment suffers. You know? The environment suffers when you're not comfortable with yourself. With you. you know? Trust me, I'm saying this from personal experience. I've been a very quiet journeyer in this life on many occasions. And... Uh, uh, there is there is a value to silence, but there's also a value to noise. There is a value to anything if you can find a way to use it, really. <clears throat> Everything has a value. It's just who is looking at that value. I remember there was this <clears throat> episode in this great show, one of my favorite shows, very educational. Uh, it's called uh, Dragon's Den, Shark Tank. I don't know, one of those, one of those shows. Okay, I think it was it was Dragon's Den, where this guy comes in into the show and he tells the guys an evaluation, five hundred thousand dollars for his company. You know, and then uh, Kevin O'Leary, uh, you know, the dragon that loves the money, loves money the most. <laughs> 
Kevin O'Leary tells them, why do you have that evaluation? Why do you have that valuation? And most people in the show, when people would say, why did you value it at that? You know, they just would give an emotional answer. You know, they wouldn't give, but this man gave a very interesting answer where, when they asked him, why are you valuing your company at this level? He's like, hey man, listen, if me and you were in an island and I had a burger and you had a bar of gold, who do you think would have, who, the burger would be evaluated more? Do you know? And so all the dragons, all the investors were impressed, you know, because the person knew how to look at something that they had created. They knew how to see value in phenomena. And one of the hardest things and uh, uh, something that every human being should clap for all the mothers and fathers of this planet raising children <clears throat> is that they know how to evaluate the life form until the life form understands how to evaluate itself. There's something in life that it depends. Everything you do is like being part of your experiential resume. A resume only you can see. Others can see the result of it. Others can see who you have become, but they can't see who you were when they were journeying. <clears throat> that means little did I realize when I was uh, in that PowerPoint presentation in, in grade 10 that I am the mover of this moment. I was waiting for others to move me. I was waiting for the attention and other eyes to accept me. I was like, well, wait, world, why aren't you accepting me so I could do what I want? Then I realized, oh man, we are each our own pilot. We are pilots here. I am speaking to pilots. I'm not speaking to human beings. I'm speaking to attention piloting through manifestation. You could be in any form. Do you know there's this thing called, I didn't know, but it, it was getting close to being pushed into law that in, in, they were taking identity so subjectively uh, flexible that the person could come and say, I, I don't identify as a human being, I identify as a fox. And they would be called foxkin. Do you know, the person could be like, people, I'm a fox. You know, it's like everybody's looking at a homo sapien human being, but that person says, my identity is a fox. Now, it's not that it's wrong. But it's just that where do we draw the line of what is real and what is unreal? Because the worst case scenario is the unreal becoming real in a way where we can't separate the real from the unreal. And that's the danger of the future cyberspace uh, reality that is emerging. People don't realize it. Right now, it's easy to be natural. We're natural. But in the future, people might forget their nature, you know? I remember I wrote this uh, script, which I, when I was in film school, I, I tried to get a lot of people to help me, make me make this, but you know, some, some, sometimes in life the weather isn't what you want, you know, the weather of even people's psychology in, a, in an environment, you know. The moment a person realizes the inner realms, there is something like weather, this life, there's something like weather, what does that mean? That means one day suddenly it starts raining, you know. It was sunny a minute ago. It's raining now, you know? And so there could be situations where you are working with a group of people and suddenly it becomes rainy. Those group, that group of people doesn't trust you or that group of people was using you. You know, there's, there's various ways that reality moves. The issue is that when there is no honesty, nothing great can happen. Nothing great. Even if it's great at the end, there's going to be a hole in it, you know? We have, we have, uh, I remember seeing... <laughs> I remember seeing Don Rickles uh, on the Craig Ferguson show, and I don't know how many people know this, but Don Rickles is one of, has one of the rarest styles of humor I've witnessed, at least in this earth. You know, he's he's a, he's a person who um, you feel friendly to him when he insults you. <laughs> at least that's the impression I've got so far. But anyways, Don Rickles was there um, with uh, Craig Ferguson. And Craig Ferguson, this late night show host, asked Don Rickles, and he's like, have you ever had a sidekick, man? Somebody who would be there with you in your shows or something? And then Don Rickles, this comedian, oh my God. He, he, <laughs> and he's pretty old in this interview, but he's, he's, he turns around, and he's like, greatness walks alone or something, you know? 
greatness doesn't need a partner. Greatness walks alone, you know? And it's like the audience laugh and he's like, I'm, and then he's, he's boasting about how great he is. He's like, when I take a shower, the water from, the water that's fell on the ground under the shower rises up. <laughs> I don't know if people understand what I'm saying, but it's, it's a funny interview, okay? But it was that there was a point that greatness walks alone. You know, and many, many events that will take place for human beings on this planet do not feel that it's, you see, on some level you are experientially alone, exist, existentially it's impossible to be alone. There's so much movement on this planet that the mind can uh, extract animate psychology. Uh, just like in the movie Castaway, we saw the dude kind of take the violent, uh, the, what am I saying? Uh, take the, take the volleyball, take the volleyball and put faces on it and in, uh, engage with human psychology. That means, believe it or not, I feel if you're a person who's born alone in nature, it's easier to, for you to be alone than after you have been exposed to people, after you have been in a social environment. You see, the value of society is how the inner realms can be shared. That's the only value. If people are living in a civilization and nobody gives a fuck about anybody else, technically we're in the jungle. It's like, what's the difference? Why We're just wearing suits, yet we're still acting like animals psychologically. So, so there has to be something that changes. And that has to do with the potentials of the cultural program, which uh, I'm going to explain. I'm, uh, to say a little bit more about the archaeofuturistic, about archaeofuturism. Ah, I personally noticed this concept of archaeofuturism or, I mean, Terence McKenna's archaic revival, he's saying the past is resurfacing uh, in, I would say, phase, phase archaic definition, definition of archaism, um, of the archaic, his, uh, his definition is that the future reconciliates into the past. That means the future the future messes up to a point that we in, engage this style of the past. Or it just somehow there's a pattern. For example, people don't realize it. I feel that in the future, the same way children potentially can get lost in a virtual reality cyberspace simulation and not know that they're in it, Sorry guys, I got pulled uh, by my inner realms for a little bit. Anyways, uh, what I wanted to say is that the same relationship we see that children again getting lost in a cyberspace simulation. It's the same pattern you saw the art ancient yogis, the Zen masters thinking life is a dream. Human beings have either looked at this world and thought it's completely real, or they've got looked at it and thought it's completely unreal, or they've been somewhere in between. Right now, I'm speaking to you somewhere in between. These Mr. Within talks are somewhere in between. All the, all the contributions of philosophers are somewhere in between. Because in reality, really, it has to do with your awareness. Your intelligence is your awareness. It is not what you know. It is not, it is not just what you know. It, it, it is how you move, how you, how you breathe as a moment of being. You know, and you may, as a human being, have never wondered about this. I don't know how many people on this planet, they just sit down and look at this whole thing and wonder, what is moving here? For God's sakes, what is moving? You know, and they, they go the mystical route and they're like, oh no, it's God moving everything. You know, and you go to the uh, materialistic, secular perspective and you're like, oh no, it's nothing moving everything. You know? <laughs> and so we're left in this situation of interpretation, massive interpretation. You, dear human being, 
are a unique uh, lens. It's like I want you to perceive your sight as a camera and every idea, belief, experience, whatever is a lens upon it and the camera is not the lens, the vision is free, your eyes belong to no man, including the man you think you are when you change everything. You know, some people fall in love, some people rise in love, as uh, someone was saying, I don't know who it was, maybe it was Alan Watts or something. It's true, you can rise in love, you know, you can also fall in love, you know. When you fall in love, most likely you're falling in your inner realm of the other. What does that mean? That means a person's mind, I remember this, <laughs> just, I was speaking about being in grade 10, I'll, I'll say another example, like, uh, at that time, I remember there was this very, very cute girl I liked, you know, her name was Elia Mada. And in my mind, I had fallen for her in the sense that I had perfected who I thought she was. It's like, it's like you know what it is? It's like you, you, you fall in love with someone, I think, when you feel you see them, right? And so she was someone I felt I had seen. I felt I had seen. I hadn't talked to her that much. I didn't even know her. But in my mind, I had created an image of her that I would intimidate myself when I was around her. Do you know? That's a flaw a, a, a lot of uh, men have. Before they become a king, they, they seek their queen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, anybody listening, feel free to send me links of nice, like, uh, ambient music, which I often listen to when I give these talks. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get to the second part. So the RQO futuristic, pretty much, we look at a moment and we're like, all right, is this influence from the past? Is this influence from the future? You know, it, it's kind of wondering about how much science will engage future imagery and how much it will try to engage the past, do you know? Uh, as long as the past is there, the future won't feel free. You know, the past keeps an eye on the future. Uh, the future is trying to see something else different than the past. When it comes to the potentials of the cultural program, it has to do with how uh, the person divides uh, reality. For me, I thought it was very singular at first. I thought I was just uh, uh, one person. You know, I thought it's, it's like psychology. I'm like, if life is so easy, I'm just me. Only for me to notice this me in the inner realms change way quicker than the outer realms. That means the meaning of my life is changing at a speed uh, superior or faster than the outer realms. And if you're a person that gets bored, that means your attention uh, has ran everywhere in the room and is looking for more. You see, people don't realize. People wait for challenges to come to them. You don't realize that you have to attempt the challenge. In mythology, all the heroes went towards those giant creatures they had to kill. They went towards the creature. The creature was chilling. The dragon was in its lair being a dragon, enjoying its gold. You know, the dragon's like, hey man, I got gold. And then suddenly the knight would go and kill the dragon and save the princess. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, only to realize the inner realms of the princess are like a dragon. <laughs> As a person who considers a multidimensional framework to the human being, uh, I require to explain to you uh, the way I see this multidimensionality. I saw four phases, guys, in evolution. In, in this, you can say this is Mr. Within's view on evolution. 
I feel that these four phases are seasons, and people may disagree with me, you're free to do so, but these four phases of evolution, which we are currently in the third, and I will explain, uh, these four phases of evolution also suggest the constitution of how I feel the attention moves in this plane of existence and how far our species has come to acknowledge reality. So the first phase of evolution, I call it the unconscious world. That means there is nobody there yet. It's just world. Nobody knows. It's the unconscious of the unconscious. It is just, I want you to think it's just the earth here. No creatures, no sign of life, even on a cellular level, imagine. Okay? Now imagine the cellular level gets so complex that it becomes a creature with limbs. I consider that the next phase of evolution where I call the unconscious self, which is, the, this is the way I perceive the objective evolution. That means how an, this is for me the meaning of the objective evolution, so I'm using it differently than Darwin here. The objective evolution. That how there was the design of legs, limbs, creaturehood, where we weren't just earth moving, an unconscious world we were an unconscious body of an animal with mindless animal an animal who there is no individualism yet to this creature so that this is this explains the evolutionary phase of creaturehood how we we as as an animal just went on surviving there was no rationality there was no observance technically nature was our imagination when we were on an unconscious self this is the second phase of evolution the third phase of evolution is the conscious self which is where I'm speaking to you and the fourth phase hasn't happened but it will happen I don't know if in my lifetime I'm probably in my lifetime but uh, <clears throat> it's the conscious world where the separate where there arises an inseparability in natural experience of existence where individualized experience and collective existence are inseparable we literally become the world right now we're parts of the world being alive the conscious uh, actually what am I saying not in my lifetime the conscious world <clears throat> so the conscious world, guys, is a point where actually it's it's not going to be. I remember the, uh, the conscious. The, see, language is the cocoon, where as an individual conscious self, we are metamorphosizing into a recognition that the boundary is kept by attention. So how your attention is is really suggesting your reality. Because on some level, all that people are considering to be knowledge is movement of design movement of form we are in an information universe everything we see to some degree is has a form even the the, the idea of imagination you might not i can imagine an apple pie right now hovering in the air but i can't hold that apple hot pie in my hand okay what does that mean? That means imagination has design. I can visualize an apple pie. I can see the subjective visuals, but I cannot touch the apple pie. So it, it is visible, yet not tangible. And so form relates to visibility. <clears throat> so these four dimensions, I have also called them zero, one, two, infinity. These four symbols I've used. This is my sort of metaphysics. Uh, I wanted to incorporate a universal language, but then upon duality, I realized there's no, uh, the next dimension is infinity. After duality, there is like, it isn't like third dimension, fourth dimension, five, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, seventh dimension. Like it can. You, you can see that, that sort of branching out, uh, numerical branching out of the dimensions, like as in, in you know, in dimensions ad infinitum. You know, it's like, hey man, how many dimensions are there here? Ad infinitum, I don't know. Look at the edge of the universe. We can't see it. <laughs> <clears throat> so this zero, one, two, infinity, these four dimensions, 
which I've also called them as seasons because I feel there is a cyclical relationship between these. <clears throat> when it comes to potentials of the cultural program, the cultural program is between the individual and uh, is, is literally the trans how uh, imagine you're a, you're a asteroid or meteor you're a meteor and imagine the earth earth's crust was made of pudding okay some sort of pudding just 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 play along just entertain me if this is a thought experiment okay imagine the earth was like pudding this meteor let's say comes in is thrown into the earth okay let's say it like this it's not called earth pudding let's <laughs> let's say it like this meteor hits earth instead of having a spherical impact on the ground imagine it goes into the ground and creates a hole so a meteor from outer space hit, hit the earth and went into the uh, created a dent into the earth created a hole into the earth and went into the earth that is ethnocentrism that is what I mean by the cultural program that your inner realm is based on not only the outer environment where you were raised in but the inner environments of those people in your outer environment which also appeared as part of the nature of the outer environment the cultural program is different for people for me, it, it, it's uh, my cultural program personally is an infusion of being raised between two countries, you know, mainly living in Canada, but also be, being in Iran for some time, and at different phases, at different ages of my life, you know. So the cultural program is infused. For example, what I mean by that is when I go to Iran, I feel more Canadian. <laughs> When I'm in Canada, I feel a bit Iranian, you know. So, so, so you see that you see the difference, the difference of the cultural program. Your cultural program is is how you have been your it's the architecture of your psychology in accordance to the first waves of information that hit you as a human being. <clears throat> and people don't realize it. we don't just hold on to information because of its rationality or irrationality because we're emotional creatures there is a sentimental value to information that means if you're young and you're in a loving family but that whole loving family believes in an ideology that it, 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 it goes against humanitarianism against humanity like human beings all children in the world should be careful you know I mean honor your parents respect your parents but also wonder about the ideological spectrum of the world you know because when I went back to Iran for example and I spoke to my cousins they had advanced in various ways their economical life but their inner life hadn't advanced it's scary it's like talking to your cousin after 10 years and seeing he's still the same guy you know after 10 years when I say same guy I mean ideological perspective wise right so it's not that we should just measure our outer success of progress you know we could have a billionaire you know e exceptional slow hand clap for this uh, uh, prodigy of the capitalistic system you know but that per billionaires inner raw inner life could be highly underdeveloped because it depends where your attention goes So guys, my attention has come to the chat section. Keith uh, seems to be sharing a passage from Revelation. These are they who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were brought from amongst men as sacrifice to God and to the Lamb, and no falsehood was found in their mouth, for they are without blemish. So, so yeah, Keith. I mean, my um, 
I mean, I have a certain awareness of theology from the Abrahamic religions. guys um i need a quick break i'll be back Okay. <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm back. Let's see. Where were we? Yeah, uh, the cultural program. So I'm pretty much saying it's your ethnocentrism, it's your prejudice, it's how you as a human being were not just spoon-fed by your parents' food, you know? You were spoon-fed ideology uh, and identity, identification, 
uh, by your environment and by the activities and events that take place. From an unconscious world, there emerged the objective evolution, the unconscious self, then there came the conscious self, I call that the subjective evolution, and then we're going towards the conscious world, which is the inconceivability of the individual and the collective. It's their inseparability, actually, which is incon inconceivable at that point. So in, in, the, in the fourth phase of evolution, we're neither people and we're neither just the world. There is this view of, uh, um, okay, let me say it like this. Just like there is a cultural program, your biological existence, you can say there's a biological program, okay? <clears throat> Various things that the human being has to attend to. You know, it, it's like it's not enough just for you to look at yourself in the mirror. Uh, you also require to look at your civilization in the mirror. You have to look at yourself as a human being and you have to wonder about what is going on. Because most people don't have a sense of what is the accurate game to play in life. Most people, if you notice how a game is conducted, is that at first it has rules. The rules define the boundaries of movement. So for me, all ide ideology is a sort of game. It's a sort of game where certain lenses of vision are authorized and certain lenses of vision are un unauthorized. Now, in nature, the person could be like, freedom, I want to have freedom to go anywhere. But you don't really want freedom to go anywhere because you don't know what that place may be. You know, the person has a freedom to walk towards a, a volcano about to erupt, you know. <clears throat> That's freedom as well. You have freedom to walk over a cliff. But the idea is it's not just about freedom. You know, it's that it, there needs to be a balance of the hemispheres of the brain in regards to discipline and freedom. Freedom is space. Discipline is like movement in the space. And once these two dimensions are really powerful, and especially if the child is taught young, like in Japan, the school system, I was shocked to hear this. It was fascinating to hear this, that for five years, they don't teach the kid concepts. They teach the kid behavior, character, and uh, ethical resolutions to life. There's this story in Japan where it was this, this person um, from India had written it in their social media. They had gone to Japan and they put their foot on the, on the subway on one of the chairs. You know how sometimes you're on the subway, you put your, like a person can put their foot on the chair if there's no one there? You know, so this guy puts the, his foot on the chair, but there were people there and he puts his foot on the chair and there's this Japanese man, this old Japanese man that takes this kid's foot and puts this kid's foot on his knees. So the kid's foot doesn't touch the subway chair and the kid suddenly gets his act straight. He, he, he fixes himself up and he looks at the guy and he's like, why are you doing this? And he's like, because we are all paying for the subway, which you have just come and put your foot on so easily, you know? <clears throat> so that's the thing, that it's the same approach we require for the civilization. Do you know? That means if you see some human being, imagine this is the future. You see a bunch of aliens in the street bully a human being. What would you feel? What would you feel? You are a human being. A member of your species is being bullied by another species. What would you do? You can see. You can have a person under attack by a wild animals. And in that moment, humans, they put aside their discrimination and they just get rid of the problem. So you see, when, when they, there's the saying, they say the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that means if there's a greater enemy to the species, the species unites. So all that the future ethos requires to do is find an opponent that is not human. Because when our opponents become humans, we kill ourselves. That's the issue. And of course, this is not saying that human beings... Uh, we are creatures that have different behaviors. Society is a system. 
if you behave a certain way in the system, the system's gonna be like, what the fuck, man? I, I invited you to this party. Now you're breaking everything in the house? Like, <laughs> so the system, <clears throat> it's kind of like, how can you make sure you're doing what's properly in the past? It's like there's an opportunity cost. If I choose to define myself by who I was yesterday, I have uh, prevented to define, to allow myself to get a new definition that I don't even have access to in my past. We are explorers by nature. When we forget this, we suffer our own boredom. Guys, I think uh, my attention came to the chat section. The audio should be on. Guys, I've I've shared a link in the chat section for this Patreon community. I mean, recently I've lost my phone, but uh, this Patreon community is a. Uh, where I've decided to just put all my efforts, you know, that means it's like my attention to cyberspace is I'm I'm living in my Patreon community, my cyberspace. Uh, my attention is there. So if anybody wants to discuss something with me or share something, or they want to share certain models they have on certain views or something, want to brainstorm, feel free to join the Patreon community. Uh, there's two doors to it, so you can search it. Uh, <clears throat> anyways, let's get back to this concept of the program. <clears throat> the sense of a cultural program is this. This holds true in the sense that if an AI, if a super intelligent computer just woke up and, like, let's say, it became conscious, and AI was like, "Did human beings create me? Are human beings my parents?" And AI would look at human beings, and it could conclude. Prob exactly without us even telling it. Do you know that we are its creator without us even programming it? Why? Because it sees that the code that it is written through for human beings, that code is language. As far as I'm concerned, human beings are walking the street with different codes of language. Like if it was a matrix screen, it would be, imagine um, like in the future, a screen like, like the matrix where all the lines vertically coming down from the screen are the thoughts of people. That means I feel, I have this kind of unique hypothesis that the matrix screen was perceiving the inner realms of people. Therefore seeing the justification of the validity. It's like seeing the eyes of the animal before the animal strikes. Guys, I'm going to turn, mute this for a second until this truck leaves and then uh, uh, yeah. Alright guys, whatever. This is hopefully it's not too hard. Ah, the archaic future. A future where the archaic is not even forgotten. Has been we found in you. Every view, everything of design. If you just considered yourself as a designer and saw morality as an added dimension, you would look at the design of phenomena and notice that endless behavioral approaches can arise. I look at this bottle of water in front of me, do you know how many ways I can hold this? Do you know how many ways I can throw this bottle of water? Do you know how many ways I can drink this bottle of water? You know? <clears throat> and how many different cups I can drink this bottle of water? The possibilities are endless of what can happen when attention moves as energy. But the idea is that energy has become conscious of itself and it has become conscious of itself through various programs of phenomenology. Uh, I consider the inner realm to be how the mind is moving, how space is moving matter. I consider the outer realms to be how matter 
space, removing the implication of space. You know, we are human beings that when a human being dies, we cry. I, I, in my own dreams, I have cried for my own death. <clears throat> in the dream. In the dream, I saw myself die, and I cried not for me, because for when I have always looked at myself, who I am is unknown. That's the point of a dynamic entropic universe. The universe is like, I'm not just bringing you here so you can just die. I'm bringing you here so you realize death is endless change. My good sir. <laughs> we have to care for the human vision beyond any ideology. That means when you see a human being in trouble, if you have ideology over who that human being is, like guys, I don't know if people have seen racism happen in front of them. I think many people have, of course, but re in front of them, like in, in like live, racism live, you know? And <clears throat> this racism, I was at a Wendy's and, uh, um, I'm not going to mention where, but uh, it was at this university in the ca cafe, uh, in the lounge area, the, the food court area of the... It had a food court area at the university, okay? So, <laughs> and it was, um, I remember I'm waiting there, it's like late at night, or only Wendy's is open. I'm waiting there, and I order a sandwich, a burger, and I wait. Now, as my burger is ha happening, and I'm going to say exactly the moment as it happened, there was an Indian gentleman at the cashier. There was a younger Indian, um, uh, a kid like my age, Indian, uh, was working there. And you could see that kid was like born in Canada. It wasn't. But the owner, uh, of the person at the cashier, um, of course, had an accent. And there was a woman also there at the cashier who had an accent. So there were two, what I felt were people, um, you know, who, who were born and raised in India who had come to Canada. And there was this one kid who was just working there. And so what is the scene I'm seeing? Okay. So I've ordered my sandwich. This very well-dressed gentleman that looked like a teacher, looked like a professor. He comes there and orders a, a gentleman with an African accent, this is in Canada, uh, <clears throat> he comes and orders, and I'm standing right there, okay, I'm standing right there, it's like, I don't know, it's, it, it's in the evening, uh, he's the only one uh, uh, who, who's in line there after me, I'm waiting for my sandwich, this gentleman comes up to the cashier and says to this Indian fellow, uh, I want this burger. Guys, in front of me, in front of me, I'm standing there. The Indian gentleman looks at this African man and says, Sorry, we're closed. I'm waiting for my sandwich. I'm waiting for my sandwich still. The, the guys, I can see my sandwich in the kitchen being made. And what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, my sandwich is still being made. This this guy is, is saying to this customer... Uh, like what a shitty businessman first of all you know <clears throat> and um i'm sorry guys i'm getting emotional here i should be more calm uh the indian gentleman says sorry we're close starts laughing the woman beside him also starts laughing the kid is shocked i'm standing there angry angry and i remember i when i get angry i speak i speak quick I, like when i i mean I haven't had that many inst instances, but situations where publicly I get angry, I speak really quick, and I, it's intense. And I remember, it was literally when the guy said that, I just said, how could you be closed when my sandwich is still there? What the hell is wrong with you? And I instantly took the bias of the situation, because I'm telling you, uh, there's a lot of chaos in this world, and the way you handle chaos sometimes is you put a mirror in front of it. And then that chaos breaks. And if it harbors deeper chaos, then it's, it's a different game. But if the person's chaos is ignorant, it breaks. And I remember I started arguing with the guy. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was intense. 
And I'm like, how? My food, my sandwich is still in the kitchen. You're saying it's closed? And the guy at the end looks at, looks at the person, you know, and uh, the, the Nigerian fellow there, and he says, okay, you get only one sandwich. This sandwich you can have, right? Like such a fucking asshole, that guy, you know? And he says that, and I'm disgusted, guys. I'm angry. It's as if, it's as if like the guy, you know, I, it was human inefficiency, right? And the guy gets the sandwich, the guy gets the sandwich because it was the only place at the food court open and he says because he looks at me and he says because you he stops talking like he's not acknowledging the guy he's looking at me and he's like I'll get the sandwich you know the guy gets the sandwich I get my sandwich I go sit at the food court and I remember I put that wrapped sandwich on the table and I stared at that sandwich for like 20 minutes disgusted have you ever you know it's like seeing something disgusting before you eat but it was human nature it was seeing something disgusting in human nature. And the issue is that it's not that. It's, it was just that, like, what was the solution there? And I thought about, like, the times of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, those, uh, those, those speakers. And I was like, reality has been heavy for many. And the more you go back in history... It's like, you want to know something more messed up than slavery? Kingdoms conquering and killing each other. Human beings have been breaking each other for eons until they realize they have minds. And they're like, holy shit, why are we breaking ourselves like idiots? Because you can never show violence without the violent experiencing violence. You can't hit someone without your hand making an impact. You see? That, that means you have always hit yourself. You have always hurt yourself first before anyone when you have attacked. And that was a sense where the cultural program was inefficient. The cultural program was biased. The cultural, the, the inner realms were ignorant to the inner realms of others. <clears throat> the greatest lesson I learned in this life was everybody I had ever seen in my life was never who I had seen them to be. They were who they saw themselves to be. That means I don't care if you're an orphan hearing my talk right now or if you're the son of a huge family and a billionaire or something. Whoever you are, after some point, you got to look at this yourself. And you'll notice the cultural program. You'll know the past is there so we can utilize it. Every phenomenon, everything in front of your eyes is there because it can have a utility. Sorry guys, I got a bit intense, but that story was intense, you know. <clears throat> it was the first time I felt like a scorpion. You know? That situation at the Wendy's, it felt like I I was a scorpion who had justified, you know, because I, I spoke rudely to the cashier, but he was being he was showing an ultimate rule. And that's the messed up thing. I mean, like, color? Color is an issue? Do you know how underdeveloped our civilization is if color is still an issue? If color is still an issue, I'm going to go invest in a, t in, in a tissue-making manufacturing company so uh, it's easier for me to cry till the end of history for what we missed out. We missed out on an advanced civilization because we cared for... Igno uh, we care to be ignorant. You see, uh, there is the, the, I think a, re a lot of violent psychology is when the person f uh, feels there is no consequence. But on some level, nobody can know the consequence of the future.
There was a time I was, uh, I'll tell you in my youth, I was raised in an urban setting. And what that means is that when there was a, a, an ant, Guys, send, send your good intentions to that house that is on fire. I feel the human being deserves way more than what kind of civilization it is seeing. And the only way the civilization can advance is if human beings stop their inner theatrics. And the inner theatrics only stop when you realize you're not a creature of language. You are an experiential attention in the moment. You are being before you do. And so this relationship of being and doing is at its core the, the uh, oscillation between space and matter. Because I am as much of an object as the subject is active. You see, for example, uh, you can see this in young children. There's this great, uh, great channel. I would advise people to listen to it. It's called Valutainment. And the gentleman in that show, his name is Patrick. And I saw one of his videos where in his video, he, he was this, um, he's a family man. And in front of his kid, this family man, he had this young kid. And he said kids can be annoying sometimes in front of his kid. His kid's in the room, he said this. When he said this, his kid went down, his young kid went and hid underneath the table of the house. The kid got upset. And of course, uh, <laughs> you know, he goes on a drive, he takes his kid for a drive, he tells his kid, get ready, let's go for a drive. He goes for a drive stops the car and speaks to his kid and tells his kid that uh, the, the day you were born was the greatest day of my life. And he cares for the inner realm of his child. And he adds another, adds, or you can, in any situation, any problem in life, You can always communicate new dimensions. You can always see the different colors of people. Sorry guys, I need to write something down. Yeah, okay, there we go. So don't forget this. Yeah, this relationship of the doer and being. Most people desire. This creature here, it desires many things. You go and you can ask if you're in a religious... Um, uh, if your inner structure, if your inner realms have arose through religious foundations, it, it's like the question of desire's intensity. It's as if um, they, in, in, in religious circles, they, for example, say, don't desire, um, <clears throat> don't have a sort of devouring attitude in sex, for example, they say. Or... I mean, I should use more proper words. Let me see how I can say it. There's a renunciation factor. There's a renunciation factor and an ethical factor. Like before the Abrahamic religions, they wanted to, they thought the life was a dream. You got to get out of it. After that, in the monotheistic sense, they thought that it requires a certain algorithm and you get out of it. A stoic algorithm. That's what religion appears to me as. A behavioral approach towards a salvation 
that only if the person's attention remains, the potential is there. You know, sometimes I feel human beings are building their afterlife with every decision in this life. For me, consciousness uh, being present is the miracle. For a long time, I was looking at this cosmos and I was like, what is the clue? What is the clue? What is the mystical clue? What is, what is, is, is it, if this world is an illusion, you know, I remember, you don't know, guys, I've had many personal moments, poetic moments where I have shouted at the sky in my inner realms. That means I've silently stared at the sky, but in my inner realms, I was shouting. I was shouting to see how far attention can go, only to realize attention is where everything is happening. What does that mean? There's a huge potential that the future generations, just like how we have this, art, there's this cool vibe to archaeology, I feel that the future generations are going to eventually dig us up. What does that mean? That means how we live now is not accessible now to the future generations. But it, let's say in a thousand years from now, archaeologists will be trying to find our social media pages, imagine. Do you know? Like my great, 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 great grandson's like, yo, who was my ancestor? It's like, holy shit, my ancestor gave talks? You know? <laughs> my ancestor talked about this very moment I'm existing in? You know, that would be a badass moment, you know? Because for me, there's two cool things about predicting things about the future. One, the past is going to be like, holy shit, there was some accuracy. And then the other angle, the cool thing is the future is going to be like, how did that guy know? <laughs> we need uh, a reform for our educational systems. We need to invite a new human being on the stage of humanity. We need to realize that there will be many new human beings and there will be many ways that life will move that even in this very moment I cannot fathom, you know? I, I feel as if like I am just a rock thrown. You know how like, I don't know how many people in their childhood did this, you know? Um, <clears throat> but I threw stones uh, at, a, at a pond, what's it called? Like the, the stone, if it's flat and you throw the stone at the water, it skips on the water, you know? And so I feel literally one ripple, and there is eight billion ripples on the surface of this pond we are calling civilization. Our efficiency, if we are a smart species, if we are smart, we will notice what's here and what's truly valuable. If we are stupid, we are lost before we can be found. That means even if you find something, you'll be like, I don't know, I still feel lost. You know, let me tell you, feeling lost when you're on a rock and in the middle of nowhere, when you're on a sphere in a vacuum is pretty normal. It's pretty normal to feel lost. It's pretty, like I am surprised human beings are not freaking out every moment, you know? <laughs> You know, people are like, yeah, man, it's like, you know, it's like, how was life? How, how was your day? You know, imagine somebody asking you that. How was your day? And you're like, it was good, man. You know, I had nice, you know, I got a promotion at work. You know, I built my, you know, uh, great work portfolio or whatever, you know. And, uh, and suddenly I also realized I'm on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Holy shit. <laughs> Do you see? So that's like an existential midlife crisis that can happen any moment. Any moment you can see the unknown is greater than the known and freak out. But when you become comfortable with the unknown, then you uh, are sitting at the tactician's table. That means, um, I am. you see, there's no point of entertaining a weak species. There's no point all celebrating weakness, okay? There's never been a point to it. But what is strength, which is the bigger question? 
okay? Because our civilization goes towards what is efficient for it, what has a utility. What does that mean? That means, uh, uh, for I'll give you an example. Right now, for example, imagine you're a very religious person and you have a Bible or a Quran or the Torah or, or, or whatever um, uh, um, uh, work of revelation uh, you have to work with. Imagine you're a religious person. This is what I'm saying, the trend of going towards the efficient and how the mind moves. That in the future, if they create this Bible, which is this small object where you click it and a hologram of uh, for example, a beautiful image of Christ appears, or, or a prophet, and this hologram of light starts uh, saying the verses, and you see three, three, like a, um, three, it's like a three, three D hologram light verses of the Bible or the Quran or something in this in this hologram, a uh, holy book, okay, device. I'm just saying a sci-fi setting. I am telling you, religious people will buy it. They will not wonder about. Uh, technologies echo because it relates to their ideological perspective so I'm saying like there is a way we treat every person as if they are either in it every person has a sphere around them few people step out of that sphere sphere of their inner realms you see the issue is not about truth truth is not is not something it, it, I'm, I'm not denying the validity of any idea because ideas exist because someone saw it possible to some degree the thing is what if the whole species is evolving from its attention being endlessly for eons locked on language and not for eons it's, it's language is believe it or not a recent development compared to how, how long history is <clears throat> Anything you fear deactivates your intelligence. And fearlessness means wanting to see what the unknown holds, but not with a desire of the result. I can tell you that I, I will 100% testify and tell everybody that this saying they say, don't chase the butterfly, sit still and silent by the flowers and the butterfly will land on the, your forehead because if you chase the butterfly you're one step up step up be, behind that is hundred percent valid i am telling you in this life sometimes when you chase or if you desire let's say in comparison to someone desiring to drink a glass of water and someone desiring a harem or something <laughs> like the kings did back in the day I'm just saying the nature of the desire is about if you are patient, uh, you learn. If you're impatient, you just see the tip of the iceberg and yet you run on to the next iceberg. Language is an advanced technology. It is projecting our cultural program, our biological program to some degree subjectively. That means, believe it or not, even though you are an object, you are this biological body, at the same time, you are subjectively managing it, not as a body. That means it's like our eyes are in the first person view, if you notice. Guys, imagine I'm on the roof of an airport giving this talk. <laughs> I'm joking. 
I don't know. I feel um, after idol worship, we started worshiping language. When we started worshiping language, we limited our freedom. When we limited our freedom, we had this creative resistance, urge of resistance. This urge of resistance led towards creativity. What does that mean? That means we opened our eyes, we were held back, we were pushed back. Because we were pushed back, we got the experience of pushing. So in our own way of pushing back, we experienced our new dimensions. I feel that we should not fear multidimensional frameworks in all branches of knowledge. Mr. Within is asking all professors of all universities to look at the field, the branch of knowledge you have, you have watered for so many years, and in some degree, classify that whole branch of knowledge uh, between a dimensional framework. At, at its most simplest, make it between singular and multidimensional. That means speak about your branch, your field of study, your, um, your specific branch of knowledge. Uh, honor it with different lenses. Do you know, for me, the, the teacher should be uh, exchanged with a name called, uh, with a different term, called the fascinator. The fascinator, the teacher, is just introducing worlds to the children. That's it. And then the teacher should be smart enough. This is why I'm saying educational system needs to reform. Where 50% of the class, the teacher does a performance and says, all right, now the students have to collectively perform. Do you know? That means the best way I feel this is a tactic all teachers should use you should, at the end of giving any lesson on the blackboard that you, your chalk's been breaking on, you know, at the end, you should tell the classroom to come up with a story where in this arbitrary, abstract story that the classroom creates, they learn all the topics because people remember stories. So if the teacher gets, if you get your child to remember a journey, do you know the child will remember it? And I'm telling you, because many people go into the educational system and they leave the educational system and a lot of what they learn, it, it goes into their subconscious. It's not accessible. But imagine in every, every uh, grade of the educational system, every student in every, uh, every um, uh, portion of the curriculum it was a story. So they told them what was your education and they would remember all the stories that they co-created in the classroom with all the students that was an accurate representation of all the teachings the teacher wanted to do. In that way, the students' minds feel they have shared, not just this feeling of the teacher gave me something, what do I do now, you know? <laughs> Honestly, I'm telling you, a lot of students don't give a shit about uh, who's saying it. They give a shit about what's being said. Me personally, it was like that. I, 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 I have seen teachers at my university who were like very shy. The teacher had no confidence. The teacher had no confidence. Then there was a teacher who had such confidence where it was as if the teacher didn't even know what to teach, but he was like, hey kids, he engaged the classroom and that classroom was better even. Do you know? Because he engaged on a human level the mind of the child, not on a such a, like, okay, you're just the camera recording these notes I'm writing on the classroom. It's like, what is this hollowness? You know, people don't understand the value of language, you know? Teachers should be roaring in the classroom, roaring questions that the student goes home and holy shit, like people look at the world that way, the student is fascinated. So that's the thing, you know, and a lot of life is um, the best thing every human being, I think, by nature is. Like, I remember this Japanese uh, narrative from this comic, Japanese comic series, where it was a warrior species. That means the species were just warriors. That means the man, woman, child, old, whatever. They were all warrior species, class civilization. You know, that means they didn't fear war. War was for their culture. Just like imagine, I don't know, perhaps Viking times, you know, 
barbarian times where it was brute physical strength that showed your genius, you know, in the battlefield. You know, but then there came the mind, and the mind was the more advanced weapon. So I will tell you the mind can be seen as a shield and a sword. My mind has shielded me from a lot of shenanigans in this life. At the same time, my mind has given me an ability to uh, like a lion charge at moments where there's a saying by Milarepa where it says, uh, you throw a stick at a lion once. I didn't understand. I wish I could. I had a time machine and I could go and tell this quote to myself when I was like uh, young. Because so many sticks were thrown at me and I felt it's okay for me to not have a value. You know? This world can be very cruel, but that's part of its teaching stuff. It pushes you so you understand that you can move around in space. It pulls you so you understand that you can stand your ground. You know? Because there's this saying in... in, in just, just, just like every general on a battlefield can, can be said to know this, that it's like the weak die first. So what you do is, usually if a general is looking at a battlefield, the weak soldiers will be used as decoy. <laughs> you know? But that's military, like not military, like battlefield tactics. Like That's the thing, you know? I, I, I feel... Uh, the school of Athens, the ancient Greeks were onto something. It's onto something incredible. You know, they had this. It's it's kind of like, uh, I guess, rumored. I don't know. Like nobody was back there alive back then. But like, um, but it was as if like the school of Athens. Uh, nobody now. I mean, uh, the school of Athens uh, back in the day. It was said that they had this secret room. Not secret. I mean, it was probably obvious because it had a door. Like, <laughs> it's like, and uh, In that room, they had, per, uh, like, attempted to create, like, a perfect sphere, perfect cube, and whatnot, these uh, three-dimensional geometrical shapes. And students in the School of Athens, or people who were there who attempted to get in that room, there were two guards with spears that would kill the person on the spot. And the guards would kill the person on the spot. Why? Because the, what was in the room were these geometrical shapes, that nobody had seen at the time. Nobody had seen what a perfect cube looks like. Like a cube, proper cube, you know? And it was a situation where they felt it was too intense. That means like Aristotle, we can say he was like, if a human being sees this cube, it's gonna blow their mind and they're gonna be divinely disturbed for the rest of their life, you know? But that wasn't the case. When we later on realized that geometry was so easy, they're teaching it in classes now. What was back in the day to Aristotle forbidden science, now they're teaching you in, in like, I don't know, grade four, you know? Reality is multiple languages. It's different languages. Mathematics is a language. My interest in mathematics is because it it has a sort of explanatory power when it comes to uh, identifying with individualism and movement. Like I feel we needed to master an arithmetic, la a, a, a numerical language before we could have had a conceptual uh, oriented language, you know? That means we needed to see that one word could be one word. And that means numerical language was required before uh, any sort of alphabet. That means alphabets bow to, the, to numbers. And numbers bow to geometry. And geometry bows to the nature that moves before being shaped. You see, right now we're shaped and we're moving. Your inner realms, your mind, you don't know. 
your mind is not just a mind. It's not like you could, it's like the person looks at the dictionary definition of their mind and they're like, oh, that's what my mind is. Great. No, it's, it's, it's like an instrument in your hand. It is divinity in the making. Your, your existence, the fact that there is existence here. Wow. And so when we reduce ourselves by thinking that we are a thought, a photo we can paint on the wall, we have dishonored the dynamism of an advanced civilization that will advance so far where the inconceivable will be our inspiration. We are advancing so fast where we can't see the advancement. So that's what that was my solution to nationalism, guys. I, I've um, there's this this project I'm working on. I call it Civilization 2.0. And it's Mr. Within's strategy to bypass extinction indefinitely. That's how I wrote it. In it, there's a sort of change of nationalism that right now it's like a sphere. We've painted color on this sphere. Uh, you've, we've painted the face of the earth and we're like, yo, this is me, that's you. You know, and we're not realizing that we, because we're treating the earth like a two-dimensional plane, we are taking ownership of land, which is an inefficient strategy if we were all living in sky cities and the earth could be an all-you-can-eat buffet for everyone. That means sky cities uh, is a suggestion that, uh, here's the thing, right now it's like, uh, imagine, a, um, here's the thing, imagine uh, an all-you-can-eat buffet, you've paid uh, for the restaurant to go into the all-you-can-eat buffet, <clears throat> and you're sitting at your table, and you come to the buffet, okay? You come to the buffet, and you go to get the vegetables, and you suddenly see somebody has put their hands over the vegetable dish, and they're like, you can't have these vegetables until you become a citizen of the vegetable kingdom you know, <laughs> or something of the vegetable nation. And then you go to the chicken side and you want to get some chicken and somebody has their hand on their chicken and they're like, you can't access. You got to get citizenship for the chicken nation. You know, and then you go to get the beef and you go get, get the, uh, the whatever and you see it has been unnecessarily uh, contained. So there is an ignorance to... That is an inefficiency unless change. There is a pattern right now continuing that unless we literally like an eagle fly into the sky and look at the whole forest, that's what eagle vision is, you know. Take notes, Assassin's Creed. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> take notes, Ubisoft. You know? <laughs> You look at your civilization, you look at the forest from the sky, and then you return to it. Remember, the eagle can fly, but it has to come back to the ground. It has to go to its nest, like at the top of a tree or a mountain or wherever. So you see, the eagle is a great metaphor for uh, nirvana where you require to go into the sky of the unknown and look at the known again and fly back into the known and uh, gear up your civilization because we're just getting started. Humanity has just opened its eyes. We're taking baby steps. This is why I was like, dictatorship is stupid. You know, people thinking, people thinking they're powerful and trying to control the world. What are you controlling? Go control a sandbox. It's the same. It's like we're just baby step attempts of a civilization to not kill itself. You know? That means there's many problems, but the solution has to come from a conscious framework. And the conscious framework can be singular and multidimensional. And it can even go through the four uh, phases of evolution and the four dimensions I speak about. The zero, one, two, infinity. Infinity. Right?
So the cultural program is in the dualistic dimension, and so anything, any experience that goes beyond duality is what I have termed the language threshold. And guys, I'm so proud of designing this concept, the language threshold. It's like, it was one of the greatest moments of my life, you know? <laughs> I don't know if it's, people are going to pay attention to it in this world, but it was, it was such a profound moment to realize that exper direct experience is deeper than indirect uh, conception and language. So study the language that you are wearing and ask yourself, is, is your clothing you? Just because you wear a jacket, does that mean that jacket is you? Just because you wear a thought one day, does that mean it's you? That means there is, there is this situation where we're like, what do we do? Because the moment you judge, it sets an echo. It sets a regression of, a not regression, what's the term? Um, an endless expression of fact, uh, like it's, it's cause and effect probabilities, guys. Like right now, if we say the effect is justice and the cause was crime, okay, so in order to, there will be an effect to the crime which will be the cause of justice. So I'm telling you, it shifts. We have to really realize we're multidimensional. You know, that's, that's pretty much all I'm saying, guys. We're a multidimensional civilization in the theatrical act of thinking we're just this, this uh, little old me in this giant place in the middle of nowhere. You know, it wasn't just Alice who was in Wonderland. The world is a Wonderland. It's, you know, it's like, what time is it? It's like when you look at your watch, what time is it uh, on a sphere in a vacuum? <laughs> you know? Communication is the most important thing that requires to evolve. If a human being is alive right now and they're like, how can I help advance my civilization? Mr. Quinn will tell you, you got to get the human mind just like you see in nature. You see birds. Like here, I'll, I'll, I'll put a picture. So guys, look at the wallpaper. Chat section is pretty quiet today. You know. <laughs> okay. Okay, I gotta find the picture. I thought I had the picture. Hold on. Okay, here, I found it. There we go, perfect. <clears throat> this is what needs to happen uh, to 8 billion human beings, uh, probably when we get clues from nature. Wow, okay. So guys, you see these birds? So we have to use communication uh, to find a common language that surpasses all ideological systems, which I feel will be a geometrical language probably, or a language of direct experience, that is like a movement like these birds. These are all birds moving. 
together, right? They're each their own sovereign individual realm, like they're each their inner realms, but their outer realms need to efficiently move like this. And their outer realms will only efficiently move like this if each bird in their own inner realm has tuned to the rhythm of the moment, the rhythm of how uh, an advanced civilization is going to be built uh, like a grand symphony. Your people are just going to hear this grand symphony, like this orchestra symphony, and every human mind, like a unique instrument, is going to join the symphony. And it's going to become one of the coolest points in human history. You know, where the mind of man decided to, to make moves. You know? <laughs> and the thing I was saying about the idea of sky cities and the future of nationalism, right now the nations are in the United Nations, which is a great advancement and the Declaration of United, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Those are all incredible achievements. But I was just looking at this idea that what is the vision of a United Nation? That means I, I looked at the, I was looking at just the words United Nations and I was thinking, what does that look like? A United Nations. You know, and I realized it would be probably inseparable from at its max epitome, like of evolution towards that, it would be uh, one nation. So I thought, what would one nation look like? And I would look, I would realize, I realized that nation has to be superior to all nations. So it's going to be the ultra nation, you know? Uh, and if you know just like Optimus Prime you know it's like the Optimus Nation <laughs> or the Nation Prime <laughs> well, we can call it many things but I'm just saying it, it, it's this idea that the United Nations has to surpass the expectation of its individual parts that means um, the body is totally different than the design of its organs and nations will become organs for this, uh, let's say, ultra nation, the one nation. Now, this idea of one nation, I was like, any image we give it, because we're human beings scattered among the, the fragmented between the nations we're in, we can't, an alien has to come and build that, uh, the meaning of a United Nations. We can't build it as human beings. Do you see what I mean? Because we each have the bias of our cultural program and national program. So if we were to design it, it would be very complex. So I would think it would be a situation where if man really uh, uh, gets access to super intelligent computers, he should probably not ask what the meaning of life is in the computer imagines this 42 like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Man should ask what is the optimal way of living for the human being. You know, just like a father goes to his son and says, son, how do I use this phone? You know, so like the son, son informs the father, you know, bring, raises the father. This is the idea of uh, children and parenthood. You know, the parent raises the child and then the child raises the parent the rest of the life. You know, that means you have to care for uh, um, the efforts of those who have brought you here, you know. By nature, of course, it's nature's law. I mean, whether you think about it or not, your nature abides by it. You know, and uh, if you listen to your nature. Um, so, yeah, this idea of the one nation, and I thought if we were all living in sky cities, it, should, we, it would mean all nations have become sub nations. That means I'm not living in Canada, it's sub-Canada. I'm not living in, or imagine, like wherever you're listening from. Like it's cool if, if the viewers can say where in the world you're listening to this. But imagine like, it, it's like no longer national. All, it's like all nations have become, the word sub, S-U-B dash, has been added in front of each nation. They are sub-nations of what? An advanced nation? that because it is always advancing, there is no way you can believe it or disbelieve it. So, so in that sense, we've, we, we have created a, a self-sustaining civilization that surpasses all dualistic foundations simply because it is endlessly advancing beyond its dualistic uh, limitations. So we no longer are in a good or bad civilization. We are creatures of attention where in accordance to where our attention goes and what it does, we feel good or bad you see 
your attention you the i'm not saying people on this planet based on their actions and the consequences of their action are are it's not that they're wrong what they're doing there is right and wrong i'm just saying on some level you as a human being are the observer of the landscape before you are the right and wrong of the landscape that's my simple suggestion here. so eventually I see that it's ridiculous why we why do we have our hands on the food dishes of the buffet we should go all live in sky cities which I which is this idea of civilization 2.0 which now that I've brought it up I should probably fully speak about it um, now, civilization 2.0 is pretty much mr. within is saying we, um, I'm suggesting we should go and live uh, for 2,000 years in the sky we should focus our technology certain great transformations required to happen and um, we build sky cities we build sky cities for 2,000 years we go live on them uh, as we are in these sky cities phase that's phase one build design sky cities a command to the whole species second phase the heavenized earth earth heaven I've named it you know and this is while we're living in sky cities all of human infrastructure on the sky in the sky <clears throat> whatever just the ground has to breathe okay does uh, the elevations of how far in the sky is is debatable and of course it, could, it totally depends on our technological in, uh, uh, interests at the time where we were interested to technologically advance um, so phase two is the heavenized earth is this idea that while we're living in sky cities uh, and guys I feel I found why the idea of the castle in the sky was in legend and people had forgotten this is the archaic revival of the castle in the sky civilization to point out to them to <clears throat> second phase the heavenized earth um, what happens is while we're living in sky cities we um, drink some coffee <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, let me get back to it. Uh, while we're living in Sky Cities, all the grandchildren of all the botanists now uh, will, the great, great, great grandchildren, on the, you know, will all go down to Earth and plant Earth. We will have the most ad advanced complex gardening projects known to humankind, known to existence. And pretty much the idea is we want to live in sky cities and restore the earth to a point where species and extinct uh, different kinds of creature would thrive. Pretty much we want to make the earth as if it's an uninhabited planet that's perfect for us before we, before we got on it. You know, that's the idea. And the third phase is an option to go take cyber sp cyberspace route seriously or to take interstellar travel seriously. And in other talks, you can find me speaking about that. But anyways, and these picture of these birds, guys, is this is what we need to see happen to humankind. This is an advanced civilization, but it's going to be with minds. And the individuality of the birds is their inner realms, and the outer realms is our workstation. You know? So, as I, so for me, even if you're a kid listening to this, let me tell you, life is like a video game where you wake up and you're in the same map. You're in the same uh, physical physical realm as everyone else. You see, existentially, that you're in the outer realms are objective. But when it comes to the inner realms, you're like that video game player behind the screen. It's dependent on your communication, who you want to be, you know, uh, how you want to move in the game, you know. And these are all factors. When a person no longer identifies with language as just them, they notice that language comes and goes. Chang Su was like, beliefs are like leaves on a tree, they change as the seasons pass. That means every day you wake up, you can't have the same belief, technically you think that to yourself, but you have become a different person. So in no way you have the same belief as yesterday, even if you wanted to, because you're a different person. Sh uh, sh changes happen. So it's a changing system. Or as Alfred Whitehead would say, it's a process. 
and we should care for this. We should care for this civilization that's in front of us. We shouldn't just let it be a sinking ship and be like, okay, whatever, I was in the corner that was, uh, sank uh, 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 before the rest, uh, that sank after the rest. You know, it's, it's, what's the point? What's the point of being on a mountain peak? You know, uh, that's the thing. That's the thing that uh, eternity was alone. There's some, some, there's a saying, um, there's something in the Sufi tradition, authenticated by Sufism, but unauthenticated by um, the Islamic perspective. And Sufism is like, like how, it's like what Gnosticism is to Christianity. So you can see how Christians may shun Gnostics. Similarly, there is uh, people in Islam who shun Sufis. Now, Sufis, they, they, they consider this hadith, and a hadith is a saying of um, uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad at, um, in the 6th century, right? So this, it, just like, again, Gnostics, they, they were focused on Christ. For Sufis, they were focused on the Prophet, you know. And... Uh, the situation was, sorry guys, just, uh, they, they, there was this hadith which was the saying where they said God, God, the source of this, the source personality, the source persona of causality, you know, um, was unknown and wanted to be known and therefore created design and existence to know itself so it's as if like eternity was alone and bang <laughs> suddenly endless temporal modes of selfhood accessible so on one level am i like um uh, is, is am I is the universe being like my vision or am I is or am I be, is being the universe you know is the universe being me or am I being the universe like you know these are these are important questions as a natural being to ask you know to wonder about what it really means that there is a mind here you know it's isn't it strange for people that evolution you know, it, it it turned an object into a subject to itself is that not fascinating? Is it not fascinating how, unlike many other species, we're aware of our mortality? Many other species, they're just obliviously, it's like their imagination is their ecosystem. We have a mind that transcends the ecosystem. That, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're a yogi in, in the Himalayas in some cave, or if you're a quantum physicist, or a theoretical physicist at a table looking at an empty black piece of paper and wondering, about the nature of phenomena. At some point, we're all, again, explorers, but explorers of design and the complexity of how we explore this design animates the linguistic simulation. And believe it or not, uh, right now, there are, the advanced communicator is not a language worshiper. Right now, many people worship language. You know what that? You know how you know this? How you can test this? You go say something to them, and you can see instantly they change, as if the words replace the image in their head, as if they, there's no independence to that image. That means there's. What I mean by that is the person is a thought. So if somebody comes and says another thought, tears are going to flow from that person's eyes. Can. Do you know? That means you got to think of it this way in this life. If in this life there's a possibility of being pushed around and also pushing, okay, two questions must be asked. What is being pushed around and what is pushing? It's all how attention evokes the form through... Uh, the complexity of added dimensions of information. So I feel that 
knowledge could never be owned. This is this may sound strange, but knowledge can't be known because it's dynamic. It's like trying to uh, use a um, a cup and putting that cup in the river and getting a glass of water and being like, I have the whole river in my in my hand. It's like no, we are perceiving a very limited range of actual phenomenology. We, are, we have even been stuck up on making sure that it doesn't surpass physical means. For me, the issue is that all ideas have a value. I mean, like just like the like it's like the, the letters of the alphabet. Does can you say somebody loves the letter A more than the letter Z? You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> it's like you don't care. They're just letters. They're just forms. When it comes to all ideology, they're just designs set in motion through human. Uh, uh, force, which its most immediate expression is behavior, and behavior is response to a world as a self. I'm just saying we shouldn't fear uh, asking questions that surpass our limitations. You know, you know, it's like this hilarious thing where the person's looking in the mirror and they're judging themselves and suddenly the person looks at the per man in the mirror and is like who are you to judge me and they realize they're talking to themselves what does that mean Th that means you are judging yourself and you are judging uh, the words that you hear from others through your experiences this is why how a person hears something is really up to them think of how many times people have spoken to you and the levels of care you had for their voice It's like this notion that it's it's like a, you can say it's the law, <laughs> it's a law or something, but it's a principle. But it's like what the it's like you're quieter around people you dislike, automatically. Someone you dislike, you see, there's this affiliation psychology that's going on, which reduces the cultural framework, the social, reduces the behavior of social creatures into violence, into violent psychology. What does that mean? That means one huge factor in society we can see is exile, fear of exile. This fear of exile is, is a pattern, is a program, psychological program one can say, that makes the person stop uh, uh, abiding by their authentic resonance. That means in this life, uh, your ecosystem can potentially become so complex uh, that you stop feeling like you. And so it's up to you. I'm telling you, everybody is a pilot. I don't care if it's a young kid listening or if it's an old person listening. It's like, I'm telling you, this, you, are, you, are your, you are the pilot of your attention. And your attention is the rarest resource. The secrets of everything is in your attention. Study how you study concentration, study attention, and in a couple years, write me a letter. You know, just study your attention. In in many teachers in this life have been like, study this, kids. Study what I've just wrote on the blackboard. You know, <laughs> but very few teachers throw a mirror at the student and shout, uh, "Your assignment is to go see who you are in this life." where every day happens once, every day you're in once. Every day has its own performance. For me, I, when, I, when I go to sleep, I'm like, okay, did I try? Did I try that day? Did I try, did I roar that day or not? So it's like the mind is like, our minds are like lions, I feel. <laughs> Anyways. So guys, uh, thanks for listening. I'm going to end the talk here, to be honest. Um, uh, I'm going to open it up to Q&A uh, for five minutes, guys. If there's any questions, anybody wants me to elaborate on something, you know, you know. And if nobody has questions, I'll probably just say a couple remarks in an end.
So, yeah, guys, um, yeah, anyone has a question, if you All right, guys, I'll continue until people have a question. There's um, 10 minutes left. Anybody has a question, feel free to share, but I'm just going to riff, I guess. The RKO future. That means the future is cannot escape the past, and the past cannot escape the future. And whatever happens in this life, some part of the past goes and makes it, is authorized to continue into the future, and some is not. It's as if, why did Socrates' words echo this far? Why is it that the word, the history has come to our attention now? I feel it's going to be a very cool time for human beings. I feel we as a collective species are are actually evolving beyond just a subjective relationship. We have been many subjects from the beginning of our lives till now. We have experienced many ways of seeing, uh, of, of the invention of conception, you know. There's been, every person is an inventor when it comes to view, when it comes to vision. You're, you're, it's like you can say uh, the biology of the human being is the greatest invention of nature. You know, made with a, with, a, with a pure geometrical genius at its core. That once we tap into rhythms, this is the peak evolution of knowledge, where it is no longer conceptual, it's experiential and rhythmic. It's a journey. It's the activation of the inner realms, socially. It's going to be incredible. That means all the time that has ever gone by human beings to find flaw, was all the time that could have been gone to see uh, uh, this genius. That know that in every moment genius is, is hidden in the soil. It is a potential in the soil of the moment. I have this view that if a person is patient enough, they can see. They can see something, they can see reality clearly. But if you're impatient, you will chase for the else. And then one day, again, somebody will throw a mirror at you. <laughs> it's like they went to the super duper enlightened guru uh, sitting at the peak of the mountain and they're like hey guru and the guru's like what up <laughs> and they're like guru what's enlightenment he's like look in the mirror man why are you asking me who said I, who said the guru knows the guru has become the unknown the guru knows he's the unknown you don't know you're the unknown the guru doesn't know anything the Guru has never known anything. How could the Guru know when the unknown is here? The Guru was just the living embodiment. The Guru, from a Jungian perspective, would be how the unconscious, the, the yogi would at some point would be, okay, here's the thing. The mystical journey starts off as a conscious journeyer, okay, conscious person journeying towards the unconscious, okay? That's the sort of mystical, for the novice, it's like that. But for the yogi who's actualized, the inner realms have actualized, it becomes the unconscious is the actual one who's conscious, and your consciousness is moved by the unconscious. So right now, you feel like a person in a room, in, in that yogic state, in that, in that samadhi state, let's say you, get, you, you become 
Uh, such it on undiced. <laughs> it is unknown moving the known, and you don't fear the unknown at that point. You are it. It's like, how, why would you fear yourself? Don't fear yourself. Because what you fear, you run away from. You don't look at properly. You avoid. Become fearless, and dimensions will open up to you unfathomable to you before. And really, the, the challenge to fear is you got to ground it in real design. That means the whole issue of fear is you just got to look at it. The fear makes you not look at something, but if you look at it and stand your ground, that per that other system is also prone to fear. Guys, it seems nobody has questions, which is that means everybody has found out that they are their own answer. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you one last story before I end off. This lion cub was raised by, let's say, a kingdom of sheep, by the sheep king. And let's tell the story in the sense that uh, the lion king from, like, let's say, the Lion King movie, uh, Pixar or any animation companies, feel free, feel free to contact me to make this a reality. You know? <laughs> Imagine the lion king. a king of lions. He is walking at the edge of his kingdom, looking at his kingdom, and he sees this fence where there is a bunch of sheep, and he sees something he unfathomable. He sees a grown lion in, in the middle of the sheep, just standing there. You know, and he sees all the sheep are uh, eating grass, but this lion is like fasting. You know? And now, I'm going to take you from towards the eyes of the lion in the middle of the sheep. What kind of life did that lion live? So let's pause the story from the Lion King being by the fence and seeing this odd lion. And that odd lion was this lion raised by sheep. And all the sheep were banishing this lion. But the king of the sheep was like, I'm noticed this lion was like such a unique creature that the, the sheep king made the, this lion its son, adopted this lion, let's say, as its son. So this lion felt he was the son of a sheep king, the king of sheep. That means he was the protector of the sheep kingdom. Don't forget that. You know, some say love was a great power. It wasn't just an emotion or happiness or joy. It was a great power. It could evoke great force. So what happens? This line in the middle of the sheep Suddenly, as if his, he has supernatural powers as far as the sheep are concerned, suddenly they see this lion notice, and the lion in, immediately informs the sheep king, imagine. And all the sheep, they run back towards the edge of the fence, even the sheep king, when they, when they notice the king, the lion, and the lion shouts the lion king shouts like a king and he shouts he's like lion and he sees the lion doesn't respond then he says sheep then all the sheep run away and this lion is standing its ground 
It's as if a unique moment of destiny The lion sees that all the other sheep have ran away. His father, the lion, the sheep king, the the, lion, the sheep that. They, okay. So guys, keep in mind. I'm gonna call him lion sheep in this story. Okay. The sheep lion. I'm gonna say sheep lion. Okay. The sheep lion, or let's say the lion sheep. I'll call it the lion sheep. The lion king, it calls the lion and says lion. The lion has never heard that word before. It doesn't know what a lion is. You know? Imagine. Or let's say like that. Just the guy says sheep and the lion and attention come. Anyways, all the sheep run and this, this lion sheep is like, whoa, why did I not feel the fear? Like like Michael Corleone in God... In, in Godfather, where his hand's not shaking. This lion has stood in his ground, you know. And this lion walks up, and suddenly you see when it's safe, the Lion King, imagine, shouts and says, sees that it's like a kingdom sort of dynamic, and he says, he calls the Sheep King. And so, the lion, the sheep lion, the lion sheep, oh, Jesus. <laughs> the lion sheep walks. Oh, man. Okay. Long story short. The Lion King speaks to the king of the sheep and then says, what is this lion doing here? And the sheep king looks at the lion knowing that it is true that this lion is different. And the king sheep says, this is my son. What do you want? You know? And the Lion King introduces himself as the king and he says, I want to go for a walk with the, with your lion son, you know? And so the sheep lion in that moment feels as if it's a moment of destiny, you know, feels as if like whenever has something like this happened. And remember, because life occurs for many people from the first person view, they don't see who they are, right? This lion king goes with this lion sheep <laughs> and they go by a pond and the lion king says The lion king says What are you? And the lion sheep says I'm a sheep and he says, look at your reflection. What do you see? And the, the lion sheep says, I still see a sheep. Then the lion king says, look at my reflection. And he sees the reflection of the lion. And he sees his reflection. And he realizes, oh shit, I was a lion this whole time. That's why I couldn't eat grass with the sheep. <laughs> <clears throat> and so he comes back and he becomes the ambassador of the sheep kingdom, living with lions. And the sheep get access to the whole forest and they're freed from their chained sheep lives. And the sheep king is like, holy shit. You know, or maybe the sheep king decides not to integrate because of the savageness of animals. Maybe they see the fence is safe. So that's when the lion sheep suddenly looks at the sheep and the sheep king is like, bye dad. You know, and the sheep king's like, follow your destiny son. You know. Pixar, take notes. <laughs> <coughs> or Disney or whatever. Yeah. Anyways, guys. That was a story to share that don't think you know yourself at first. Life is a journey. Every step of it opens new dimensions. Every step on the mountain shows you a new view. Thanks for tuning in. And this balance between the archaic and the futuristic 
you got to realize the present is wise. And so let nature be the co-pilot in the journey to whatever realm you find. You know, we're not here to get to know our uh, selves or others only in this life. We're here to get to know the nature of our world. Why not? Why not realize that we are the most advanced communication of this universal sector so far? That means if I see an alien, I'll like, okay, then I'll consider maybe jealousy, you know? <laughs> but human beings being, uh, comparing human beings to human beings, it's like, hey man, we're in the same boat. It's like, there's no point. You know, it's like when there's a hole in the boat, just run and fix it and then chill out. You know, for me, the whole strategy for human civilization, the reason I want peace is because, you know, you know, genius is shy. Did you know genius is super shy? And if there is peacefulness, that means a, a safe playground or battlefield where the greatest artworks can emerge, art is going to be what is going to show any extraterrestrial civilization in the future that may make contact with us, we are advanced. Our communication is our art, is art in the making. Before the, I had said these words, nobody had said these words with this voice, with this way, with this tone. We are a unique event in history. And so most people, their memory is their own history book, history book of their own events in their life. But uh, we have to build an advanced civilization because when else can we build it? In the afterlife? <laughs> In the afterlife, the moment you consider uh, reality is there. The man who conquers fear has a wisdom that perhaps can no longer break. An attention that is free even from the concept of a conditional freedom. Because now is the only stage of greatness, you know? Shakespeare has this quote, he says, there's, th um, <clears throat> some are born great, some achieve greatness. Some have greatness thrust upon them. And the interesting thing is, in the, in the action of greatness, there is an inseparability that you just looked at your world and you're like, all right, let me give it a shot. Let me see, let me see what is the real strategy. That means for me, I want to, like, you know, it's like, <clears throat> you know, it's like being on a battlefield. Like, imagine uh, your kingdom is at siege and it's back in the day in medieval times. And imagine there's a soldier in the army, in the battlefield, uh, be, like defending the kingdom, and the soldier's like, I don't like my sword, it's too heavy in my hand. You'd be like, buddy, they're about to come and kill us, you know? <laughs> the sword is heavy in your hand, trust me, your body's going to be heavy if it's, if it's gone, you know? You don't have to worry about the weight of the sword if you're dead, you know? So, so learn to fight. And in this t modern time, it's no longer physical, a physical fighting, that's it required. It's an internal reestablishment of the values, the, the greater values of the world. It's as if somebody said, why are you, Mr. Within, why are you building an advanced civilization? The answer, why not? Why not see what that would be like? I feel it's overpopulation is, I'm happy. The more human beings there are on this earth, the more human I feel. And I feel the more minds there are, like how many Albert Einsteins are being born in the world right now? You know, it may, it's, it's like there's this feeling that we are problem solvers, even though like the solution to overpopulation is easy. I would say everybody populate as much as you want, but like have, we should have the backup plan of sky cities because three-dimensional space, endless people can live, you know? Sky cities will be realized as the most important technology ever. <clears throat> the most crucial. And it's the evolution of cities right now. Right now you're sitting in a house. Imagine there was a tsunami. You want your house to literally have a jetpack under, underneath it and fly into the air and watch the tsunami like an event. 
you know that means imagine a hurricane comes and the houses they are like ships they they lift off into the air and they relocate you know <clears throat> and i'm telling you in the future right now real estate is based on interior design and exterior design but the real estate value of a house in the future will increase in accordance to the technology it has especially when interior design becomes super intelligent which is great i would love to be in a house that when i when i when i feel like lying down suddenly the furniture has moved from wherever it was to where i wanted where i was you know like you know because i i don't know i, I feel geometry is something where the more you play with it the endless it becomes so it is really you have to have a contentment with the void with the singular and the dualistic before you really can understand the infinite value that geometry has for the inner realms, the infinite implication of it. <clears throat> I call it uh, living geometry, where in the inner realms, geometrical phenomenology occurs without you even thinking about it or moving. It's just an occurrence, like an event. Like you're witnessing, like, like right now I'm seeing a squirrel move. It's like in my inner realm, seeing an event, seeing a phenomenon similar, but it's not, it, it's, ge it's geometry moving instead of a squirrel. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. Uh, anybody who wants to discuss these things further or um, whatnot, feel free to uh, contact me at Patreon. Thanks for tuning in. Blessings. And one thing that must be said, the only thing left to do on this rock, rise, mankind.